Hello there, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan, and I and I have to and I have to address the elephant, the pink elephant in the room, which is what this little lamp is sitting on. I've read your comments. I know everyone's talking about this, and like, look, you know, so many people talk about like body rights, like women's bodies rights, like you know, the abortion talk is is all over the place in the last few election cycles. But like, no one really talks about men. Right? Like millions of babies, male babies every year, get the tips of their penises cut off before they even know what's going on. I mean, they have no say in the matter whatsoever. Like what happened to my body, my choice? How come so many men are caught up in the abortion argument when it's, it's like a woman's body? It's really, you know, like, do you really care that much when they're doing this to the guys? I mean, so many, boys will never grow up and understand the pleasure of having foreskin it's kind of wrong isn't it like we've we've created a society where women are normalized to grotesque cut penis foreskin anyway this is your fault you guys mentioned it so i had to address it let's continue today's video which is going to be about arc raiders and you know after reading the comments in my last video i realized like there are a lot of things i need to research and things I kind of want to discuss. First, I noticed that there's increasing hostility in the social media debate about arc raiders, as happens when people get passionate about things. I usually cover Star Wars, so I understand when fan bases get passionate about an IP. That usually is a sign that there's something valuable there, but at the same time, there's there's a lot of negative stuff that can happen. And as far as the arc raiders, like, community is concerned, there, there seems to be a lot of gatekeeping uh, in between the two main I guess player groups we have. We have the more PvE focused Loot Kings versus the more PvP focused Battle Hawks. So let's take a look at this dynamic and let's try to first find a common ground, right? Because that's important. I know a lot of people perceive my last video as being overly enthusiastic about the PvE and cooperation aspects of the game. But you have to understand that's just my experience in the game. It doesn't have to threaten how you play the game. Also, I'm not against competition. I've played sports my entire life. I love online shooters, anything from a Milsim to COD. But I'm also like working 70 hours a week and I'm a dad. So I, I don't, I just don't have the energy sometimes uh, to get really into hardcore games, unfortunately, because I, I do want to. But like nowadays, I find myself just wanting to have a fun experience rather than just winning all the time. And, you know, sometimes that fun comes from unique gameplay dynamics and experiences, which Arc Raiders has a lot of. And that doesn't mean I'm condemning the PvP players or even the rats. My gameplay loop is basically farm for resources in solo and then PvP in trios. Despite what you might think, without PvP players, this game would not be anywhere as fun. There wouldn't be excitement and adrenaline. You know, the, the rush you get, running to the elevator and then making a safe underground all those things would be missing because without pvp the stakes would just not be as high and also without the aggressive shoot first players the positive experience has also become less special right it's really about having the choice to not shoot someone right to not to delay your gratification a little bit so that you can unlock new gameplay elements by being cooperative with someone that is what's always intrigued me about this game. I have to also really push back against people saying that if you rat in video games or shoot on site, that that makes you a bad person in real life. That's a completely wild statement. Like I understand games can get frustrating. You work really hard and someone does something incredibly cruel to you or, or what you deem is horrific. One, that player could be a 12 year old or you know, maybe that person is deranged, but more importantly, that's what these games are designed for. I mean, they're just playing the game like how it's made. You can't blame people for that, you know? It's not like real life and someone is stabbing you. That is a very different situation. On the flip side, uh, disliking PvP does not make you weak or soft. It might be important to you specifically, which is cool. You know, like some people really like gaming, but to try to push that onto other people, it's cringy and it's weird. Okay, and so I'll say what I say when I'm, you know, doing a Star Wars video about something controversial. Guys, let's just relax and have fun. This is entertainment at the end of the day. You know, the second a video game starts making me feel angry and stressed out, that's when I start reassessing my relationship with that game. And we've all been there, guys. You know, for me, it was Battlefield 4 and the Metro map. I thought I got good at the game, and uh, then I started getting really angry every time I didn't do well. And I would end gaming sessions really stressed and, like, tired and not feeling great. And then I realized, you know, after a thousand times playing that map, that, you know, laying prone for an hour, uh, with your light machine gun aimed at a bottleneck in that stupid map is just 
that's not it. You know, that's not a fulfilling game experience. It's stupid. <laughs> so yeah, appreciate your fellow gamers, all of them, because they're what makes online gaming so great in the first place. And it's this diversity of play styles and personalities that really makes Arc Raider shine and why it's so chaotic. And it's also that diversity uh, in the game that surprises me because usually you don't see games with this wide and different of a player base. I mean, why are there so many casual and friendly players in the dark and cutthroat world of extraction shooters? Extraction shooters are high stake environments where players have to weigh the potential acquisition of valuable loot against the risk of losing all acquired progress upon death. This is not the type of risk or stress that more casual players usually like, right? And usually in a PvPVE game, you have special areas where PvP is allowed. You know, Tom Clancy, The Division, was mostly PvE except for in the Dark Zones. World of Warcraft's same thing, but it had their battlegrounds for PvP. Although, back in my day, my internet could never handle battlegrounds, so like, you just kind of like lag and then suddenly like 20,000 points of damage would be done to you in a split second and you have no idea how the hell that happened? Probably some stupid hunter or wizard. But yeah, that's how developers used to keep the PvP and PvE players away from one another so that, you know, no one had a bad time. But in Arc Raiders, there doesn't exist such a zone. And if you're a developer and you're after money and maximum player retention, you really don't want these players getting upset and leaving. You don't want casuals to say, you know, you know, this, this is way too hard, I'm out. And you also don't want, like, you know, a hardcore player to chase someone around the map for, you know, half the match and realize that they uh, they didn't equip anything in their loadout because they're stupid. That actually, that did happen to me. I, I was the guy who, who equipped nothing and loaded into a match. Happened to me last night. So how do you accommodate PvP, you know, elite hardcore players and PvE casuals who just want to chill? How do you make sure that one group doesn't ruin it for the other? Well, in the comments, I noticed a lot of people talking about Embark, the company behind Arc Raiders, utilizing some type of algorithm to alter matchmaking so that people are paired with players of the same playstyle. This is a really interesting topic to me because, like, we're all familiar with, like, player matchmaking, right, based on skill, based on the level of your gear, stuff like that. But matchmaking based on playstyle in this case seems to be a much better way to separate gamers so that they can play with other players with the same mindset who want the same thing out of the experience. Now, extraction shooters on paper sound like a great idea, right? I've always loved the concept. High stakes, a lot of tension, and adrenaline. But in reality, most extraction shooters do fail, maybe because of balancing issues, maybe the community gets too hardcore, too elite, and they start gatekeeping. In some cases, it's just too many cheaters or bugs. But because the stakes are so high, when people lose in an unfair way or in a frustrating way, that might be the last time they play this game. And that is, I think, something that really happens a lot in extraction shooters. And so if you think about it, aside from like Hunt and Tarkov and a few other games, how many other extraction shooters are actually financially successful, have large player bases that play every night? Do you guys remember Team 17's Marauders? What about The Cycle, Frontier, a game that launched with a lot of hype and support and actually reminds me a lot of Arc Raiders now that I look back on it, but failed because the players abandoned it. Do you know which extraction shooter is actually the most successful aside from Arc Raiders? Don't overthink it. It's Helldivers. And yeah, it's all PvE and they even have a really fun Starship Trooper kill the Xeno vibes that I think definitely brings the community closer. So basically, extraction shooters are an amazing idea. The problem is the hyper competitiveness and high stakes can be a turnoff for people without the time or skill to actually have a meaningful or fun experience. This is a problem that requires innovation and smart gameplay design choices. Video games are not just about graphics and coding. When you have humans playing together against each other, one has to think about the psychology of the players and how social interactions are happening. And if you actually do a little more research into Embark Studios, this is a disruptor. They're not a normal developer. I mean, they're using cutting edge technology like LLM generative AI to kind of speed up the process of game development and try to figure out new ways to, to you know, approach players. They were the studio behind the free-to-play shooter finals, which incorporated server-side physics and destruction engines through the AWS cloud. That made for some genuine dynamic gameplay where basically you can break and destroy the entire map. Battlefield 
as early as Bad Company also had this feature, but the destruction was more client side and based on pre-scripted collapse animations. Everything in finals, however, happens naturally. That's the kind of innovation I want to see in gaming. Like, please, someone make Madden with a universal physics engine in it. And yes, I know there's a lot of controversy about Embark using large language models. I think people are angry about the, um, like the generative voices that you can use to mask your own voice. Every serious company in the world is trying to create LLM agents to somehow streamline what they're doing or, you know, make work cheaper. I have many reservations about this technology. I think for one, calling it AI is, is kind of misleading. And I think our society and our economic system is clearly not prepared for this technology. But while everyone is like focusing on just generative AI and you know how they keep stealing art from people, I think we're like missing, I think a lot of people are missing what's actually happening. These LLMs are going to give efficiency boosts to almost every industry in the world. And in some industries, it's really gonna change how we live and probably for the better. When I'm not making these videos, what I mainly do is I, I research companies and I invest. And guys, uh, the pharma and healthcare industry, for instance, is gonna be one of the biggest beneficiaries from this technology. Graph neural networks are speeding up medical discoveries massively. LLM allowed researchers and doctors to bring all relevant data they need for a case. Neural networks can create simulations that can help us find new drug molecules or biosimilars. And actually, uh, you know, those previous concerns that LLMs will replace radiologists because uh, they're that good at scanning pictures to find anomalies, that's actually not happening. Instead, what has happened is scans are much cheaper than ever and people are getting far more scans scans than before. This is probably because imaging technology is getting cheaper and better. But anyway, the result is now we need more radiologists than ever to interpret all the findings from these scans. So it hasn't taken away jobs in that specific field. You know, one day your life might be saved by one of these scans because they're going to get cheaper and cheaper. And even if healthcare continues to suck, maybe, maybe we'll be able to afford it. Who knows? At the same time, maybe uh, you'll get cancer and you'll take an immunotherapy treatment that is specifically tailored to your genetics and it works, which would be great. You know, I lost my mom to cancer, so I know, I know the feeling of like seeing someone f like just wilt away from all the chemotherapy, it's, it's horrendous. Great leaps and advances will be made because this technology is able to free up people from more mundane and repetitive tasks. It means proficient workers who are in the top, you know, 10, 20 percentile in their fields are going to get more efficient. They're gonna make more money. They're gonna have more opportunities to do things that they previously couldn't. But at the same time, the people in the bottom half they're gonna struggle finding work. And that is the big problem, I think, with a lot of these LLMs and generative models. That's what I'm really afraid of more than anything else. The problem with AI is not the technology itself, it's just the barbaric and cruel economic and social system we have here, especially in the United States. I worry that our government will be useless in the transition uh, towards like less work and be unable to counter the volatility that this tech creates. But I think when you approach LLMs and like generative AI with a very emotional and like black and white point of view, like I hate these, like they're taking away my, you know, my I'm a commissioned artist and they're taking away my painting jobs. I know that can be especially tough and personal and I, I honestly don't have a, I don't have like a solution for that because I think the damage that LLMs will do to creativity, it, it, that, is a, that is a serious problem. But on the other hand, getting emotional, getting too caught up into things will leave you even more exposed to the potential downsides of this technology. I always say it's better to study the T-800, you know, figure out how it works so that you can properly deal with it rather than just, you know, get upset at it. Anyway, uh, before I get further sidetracked, the theory here is that Embark Studios is using LLMs or some type of algorithm to determine their matchmaking. This is all theoretical. I don't have access to their code or like, you know, company insiders, but basically what Embark can do is make sure that players are grouped with others who act just like them. And in order to do this, they have to just take a closer look at how you act in game. And they have a multi-channel feedback system kind of built in. As many of you mentioned, there are surveys at the end of the game. These flew right over my head because I generally ignore these things, but the surveys and arc raiders are not random. If you encounter a PvP situation, they will ask you after the match, how do you rate your experience? If you encounter a big group of arcs, they'll ask you, how is your experience fighting the arcs? And Bart can take your answer and match that with other metadata from the match, like 
what kind of players you were playing alongside, or what level of difficulty were the ARC's AI set on this match. And then there's the actual data from your gameplay decisions. How many times have you shot at players? How many times have you instigated firefights? How much time do you spend looting? What kind of equipment or skills have you gone after? I typically do free loadouts and just loot when playing solo, and so naturally I'll get paired with other solos who are peaceful. Because again, it's disappointing to kill someone who only has a stitcher and some rubber ducks. Once they gather all that behavioral data from a player, they compress it into what's called an embedding. Basically, a little vector of numbers representing your playstyle. Players whose vectors sit close together get matched by the machine. This kind of lines up with industry thinking, and while there's no actual proof that Embark does this, I think a lot of players are beginning to suspect that something like this is actually happening. And it's not perfect all the time, but it does work most of the time, at least for me. When I bring an anvil, the Turo, and a stack of grenades into trios, the system immediately throws me into the deep end. I know a lot of people have been trying to playtest this, and we only have like anecdotal evidence that this is actually occurring. But I, for one, am really excited about the fact that we're even talking about these types of developments, because I'll be honest with you, more than anything, gaming has grown boring over the years. Like Ubisoft and EA basically ate up all of the best indie and mid-sized developers and then killed them. I think the last time I really got excited about a game was probably Half-Life Alex in VR. But this idea of LLMs becoming more incorporated into gaming, that could be like groundbreaking for players. Right? I mean, that, that could be a really good thing. Right now, it's potentially being used in matchmaking, but what if one day, instead of your usual pre-written NPC engagements, you just deal with LLM agents? I'm already seeing like mods in Skyrim trying to kind of create this type of situation, and I think this could be a renaissance for gaming and usher in new crowds of gamers from all demographics, including a lot of casual people who just might be bored by typical games. Look, technology is going to march forward whether you like it or not, and all throughout human history. Those who stand against the technology, they've, they've been forgotten. And unfortunately, yeah, people are going to suffer. I mean, look at the early 1900s, you know, uh, all those world wars were most likely a result of our industrial revolution, the great job displacements that happened, the, the economic boom and bust, right? What's important in these times of great change is to maintain mental clarity, to not get emotional, to try to learn and understand what exactly is happening. I mean, you could think of AI like a hurricane, right? It's better to understand how a hurricane works, what weather phenomenon feeds into a hurricane, how it changes its trajectory, how powerful the winds are so you can build the proper shelter to weather the storm rather than just get angry at hurricanes and call them evil and pray to like some god to save you. Because ultimately, the person who does try to understand the technology, the person who tries to stay ahead of it, those are probably gonna be the people who are gonna take advantage of it. That's just how things work in life. and. You know, as much as I would love real life to be PVE, it's not. It just doesn't.